Hi, I'm Paula from Valenta BPO, and I would like to welcome you to the next episode of the Insider video series. I would like to introduce you today to Chris Colbert, who is one of our um, salespeople, business development coaches that we work really closely with. And today's topic is really interesting. We're going to delve into the psychology of sales, and we're going to really look at the four, the four reasons people don't buy. So, Chris, do you want to kick off and maybe give us a bit of an introduction about yourself and your business and what you do? Sure. Yeah, I suppose I, I have two businesses, really. One is the consulting business where I talk to companies like Valenta BPO about sales and buyer behavior and, and kind of how to influence people in our direction when it comes to, to our business and business growth. Um, but I'm also an owner of a wholesale business, a wholesale herb and spice business in Australia. Um, so I, uh, I've got two roles. One, I practically implement what I talk about and the other, I, uh, I train. So yeah, and okay. my, my background's a sales background. So thus, thus I, I kind of love the subject now. Okay, brilliant. So today we're going to talk about the four reasons people don't buy. I'm really excited about this because um, my background is marketing and sales. Um, so we talk a lot about those reasons and um, yeah, I'm really interested to get your thoughts and sort of if you can walk us through um, those key four behaviours, it would be, um, yeah, be great. Yeah, no worries. Look, I, I really like it. I found, I got introduced to this by uh, an old university lecturer actually when I was doing a degree and was teaching a sales management component, but in his, it was a part-time job. His full-time job was selling kitchens. And he introduced this four reasons people don't buy. And, and of all the training I've done over the years, um, I found it probably the, the best cornerstone for a conversation with people about sales or, or learning to sell and things to focus on, because it's a really nice filter for your experience um, and to kind of pass your communication through, your conversations through, and see the just a kind of a checklist to make sure that you're addressing the four reasons people don't buy. And the reason we say don't buy is because often it's quite easy to understand why people do buy. It, it's, you know, when somebody says yes, they've generally given you a pretty good reason as to why they say yes. But more often than not, when somebody says no, they, they don't sit you down and give you a lovely explanation as to why you didn't get the business. Generally, they just disappear or they've gone elsewhere or they stop returning calls. And so what this does is give us a really neat, easy way to kind of reflect um, on ourselves to see what we've done well or what we may have missed out on. It's also a way, I, I, I'll talk to you about it, but for me, they're almost like batteries we want to charge or, or fuel tanks we want to fill. So the more of it we have, as far as the four reasons, then the stronger our offering, the stronger our chances of winning the business. But also often you can see some association with the strength of our negotiation position as well. The stronger the reasons we have for people making a decision in our direction. So yeah, I found it really simple and it's a nice way to look at other purchases or decisions we make ourselves in life in purchasing. And you will kind of see these four reasons flow throughout your life, whether it's homes, cars, even the food we eat, the clothes we choose to buy. You can really apply this across most aspects of life as far as uh, buying decisions goes. And it was so something that I'm not really... To, sorry to interrupt. Do you think this is... No. So it's appropriate for all industries. What we're going to talk about today, it's not industry specific. Every business has a sales team. Every business needs to make sales, whether it's products or services. So it is like such an appropriate topic, right? Exactly. Whether you're an account manager for a, a FMCG business, if you're in car sales, if you're in... Uh, consulting world, which obviously at, at Valenta we deal in consultancy, um, selling widgets, you know, it, it regardless, then you'll find this applies. Interestingly, I think too, some of these aspects also just work in human relations. You know, if we're wanting to, you know, we often all work in teams and groups or, you know, we're part of the, you know, mother's group or we're a part of a sports club. If you're looking to influence people and persuade people, and it's often, you know, interesting to keep these things in mind and see how they apply not only in you know a sales situation but just in business generally or like I said negotiation so there's lots of applications the deeper you dig on it and start to think about it the, the wider you can kind of uh, can take the theory okay awesome well should we kick into those four reasons there's four <laughs> and I say four reasons we don't so we're going to go no now we had a chat, when we had a chat about this conversation, we talked about a purchase that you made, all right? And I thought we could use some examples. So let's do that. Let's kind of use the example of a car, 
right? And I bought a, I, I've bought a car recently too. And it's a really great one to choose because you tend to find that these are quite clear. Sometimes it's a little harder to see the relationship, but in things like homes and cars, we can pretty quickly attach to them. So you bought a car. I right? did. I did All just right. three months ago. So, so the first thing that we have is we need to be able to fulfill a need. And without getting into too much, we tend to find that there's two types of need we fill. We've got a, a, a personal need that we fill. And I just recommend if anyone wants to get into it and you've done marketing, so you'll love it, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So <laughs> as a human being, we have human needs. And actually just interesting, we'll, we'll maybe if we do another session on this, we'll do the six pillars of persuasion and, and we'll talk about kind of scarcity. And so, you know, you'll a great example of this and of the human need and us fulfilling human needs we've seen during COVID. I mean, what greater example of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and this kind of emotional purchase than toilet paper during COVID. Now, was it, a, was it a practical need? We made a buying decision, but we didn't make a buying decision based on a practical kind of a business requirement or, or a logical one. We made it on an emotional one. We made it on a personal kind of need, a, a human need, an emotional need. So we've got the, the emotional need, but then we've also got what in business we'd call a commercial need. In personal terms, you know, more comes around, you know, your practical requirements of the family and the like. Um, in the commercial world, you know, we kind of call it a commercial need and we look at things that we've got to fix, avoid or accomplish. And so obviously if our, if our product or our service isn't filling a need um, in either of those areas, then we're really gonna to struggle to sell a product to somebody. If they can't identify and connect the value and how that product or service fills a need for them, um, then our likelihood of success diminishes pretty considerably. So in the case of a car, have to think about it. What was the need? What was occurring in your world and your life that you made a purchase of a car? Reason, very old car. So I had a very old unsafe car. So a bit yep. of a pain point, but also um, the government had an incentive at the time to purchase vehicles, So, and which was in line okay. with COVID. Um, yeah, so that was definitely one of the main reasons that the car was purchased. And if we dig a bit deeper on safety, is it your safety you're concerned about? Um, my safety, my family's safety, because I do have young children as well. So that was also a big consideration yep. when purchasing the vehicle. Yep. And so you tend to find, and you probably find that the vehicle will reflect that need. So you'll go, I've got a vehicle and that, that vehicle is actually reflecting the family. I've got a family mm -hmm. need. And I think you would probably find if we went back to this kind of version of, is, is it both a mix of practical and emotional, like practical in the sense that I've got kids, I've, hey, I've got kids or I had kids and I just picture all that enormous amount of guff that you've got to carry around in the back of the car prams and walkers and bags and all that sort of fun stuff. So we've got a practical need. In, in this case, as a, as a, you know, just a family, in a commercial space, that might be, you know, things that we need to require from fleet or whatever the case may be. But also you've got that connection to that personal human need, that Maslow's hierarchy, where really security and safety are one of the two core frameworks of, you know, our human need. One of the strongest emotions that we will have is around safety and security. You know, first is food, you know, and next up the chain really becomes safety and security. And we see that through advertising of you know, things like insurance companies and the like really hone in on that Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that idea of safety. So in your case, we can see kind of two examples. I've got a practical need and we'll get to the idea of the government incentive, right? But I've got a very <laughs> practical need, which is my family getting them around and I've got an old hunk of junk that I've had for a long time. And I've got the emotional need of, I want it to be safe and secure for the family. As I'm raising these little ones, it becomes really much more important than when we're, you know, just by ourselves as a couple, we're happy to hop in some dodgy van and drive around the country three times. As backpackers, not you a problem. You might be. <laughs> <laughs> get, a, get a couple of kids in the equation and all of a sudden there's seat belts and a lot more safety going on. Suddenly we hit the Volvo, right? So it, it happens, it's, it's, it's that human need. It's how we operate psychologically. So that's the first one, because I'm conscious of time. So I'll, I'll move through on. But need, and, and really it's, it's how much value we can attach for the client or the client attaches to that need. So we've got a service. They may or may not be aware of a need that we're looking to fill for them. But our job is really to make sure that we understand the needs of the clients and what they value really deeply. 
In the commercial world, it's what are they looking to fix, avoid, or accomplish? What are their goals? What are they trying to achieve? And how well does our product or service help them meet those goals, meet those needs? And we want to attach it. The stronger we can attach it and the stronger that, that the client values that product or service to meet that need, the better chances we have of success. But just because we have those needs, just because you need a, a, a vehicle that can house the kids, the husband, and all the guff that goes along with the family, doesn't mean that you'll make a purchase. Right? Just because you have a need doesn't mean you'll buy. So as good as our product or service may be, as amazing as it is, doesn't mean we're going to sell it unless we can meet the other criteria. All right? So the next one would be, let's start with, uh, I always like this one because it's, it's pretty important. It's a little hard to measure, but trust. So what brand of vehicle did you buy? Um, a Hyundai. A Hyundai. And so tell me about why Hyundai. Um, to be honest, I never thought I'd buy a Hyundai because they used to have a bit of a poor reputation. So I'm more of a Toyota kind of person, um, which is, you know, old and reliable Toyotas um, so you're here in Australia. Um, but the Hyundais have come a very long way with quality and value. Yeah. So I yeah. compared to like a Corolla, for instance, which is a Toyota, I got yeah. far more in my purchase than what I could have got for the same money with, um, actually, I don't even think I could have purchased a Corolla for what I bought my car for. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was just impressive with like what they actually delivered for the value. I was very impressed. The, the quality versus the value. And I know, I think I, you know, I've got some crazy long warranties with them these days too, right? They yeah, I got a 10 warranty year, yeah, I got a 10 10 year extended warranty. warranty, which is crazy, right? So Crazy, right? So you can actually just <laughs> add to add to the end of that. If, if even the way you described Toyota when you first said that, I could have simply added the word worthy, trustworthy. Mm. And so it's a trustworthy brand. Now, obviously, as businesses, we create a brand recognition and we create trust in our brand as businesses. So that's a big part of what what we spend our time doing. Why? Because it's so important to get people making a buying decision from us. They have to trust us. Um, Again, I'll keep coming back to, and, and it's probably a, a flip chart I might pop behind me just so that people can think about it as we go. And this is one that we'll find that people will challenge me on or, or maybe challenged by the idea of, but we buy, we justify, we buy on emotion. And we justify with logic. <laughs> now, I've been in front of some big rooms of people and, and uh, some very traditionally, I work with a, a group in Germany and, and very traditionally, very straight up and down the line, really want to make very logical decisions. The reality is, if we talk about people's homes, for example, I'll often say, so tell me about that house when you went into it. Well, we loved it. Oh, yeah, tell me more. Well, it was close to the school. It was near the railway line. It was close to work. What were the first words that come out of people's mouths? We loved it. Then we justify with logic. Yeah. And the other, and, and so this decision, it, it, you know, we think of uh, luxury brands. We think of where we make decisions, whether it's organic food, you know, there's lots of ways in which our emotionally, our, our kind of personification, we, we, we demonstrate ourselves through our purchase. You know, we show ourselves. And so logic is there and we'll justify our position with the logic. But really that initial decision making is, is very emotional. As much as we may often think it's not, if we get back to the root of it, we'll often find an emotion there at, at the very core of that buying decision. Um, and I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind, and I'd recommend for anyone that, that kind of sees this video, that, um, that check out, there's a, um, a great uh, piece of work by Simon Sinek called Find Your Why. And it's a really great, that's just going to blow around. So I'm just going to ask you to remember, we buy on emotion, we justify the logic. <laughs> so it, it's Simon Sinek has a, a video on YouTube, just look it up, called Find Your Why. And it's this really great idea about the golden circle and, and how really our first decision we make is on, on why people do what they do rather than what they do and how they do it. Um, and a lot of the decision making that we have around buying is done in the limbic brain. And the limbic brain doesn't have um, words. It doesn't have a vocabulary. So it's very emotionally based. Um, and so trust and trustworthiness becomes really important. So if I was talking to a business um, 
you're going to use things like uh, case studies, referrals, testimonials. I mean, just imagine yourself, for example, if there was a new movie that came out and it's got Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. And you're like, I'm not watching an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. But then you're talking to your mum on the phone and she goes, well, Paula, you've got to see this thing. Next thing you're like, well, maybe I should check it out. If mum says I've got to check it out. Why? Because I trust her, right? The relationship with the person making the recommendation, the closer that is to you, the closer that person is to you, then the more trustworthy you are going to be of whatever that product or service is. You also find here's where you get things like, it's called social proof in, in Robert Cialdini's Six Pillars of Persuasion, social proof, celebrity endorsements, things of that nature. But it also comes in, and in fact, Cialdini talks about this as well. It, it, it's about your consistency and your approach to what you're doing. For those out there with salespeople entering the market, it's really about ensuring that, that you as a person, if you're doing the role or if you've got a team that are doing it, have a very consistent language, very consistent approach to it. Um, often in sales, people take quite an ad hoc approach to their conversations, how they present information, how, how they go through the process. Um, but I wouldn't be very comfortable if I was about to hop on a, a, an airplane and I saw uh, the pilot talking to his co-pilot saying, hey, man, I just like to take it as it is, you know, let it be organic. No, we want a process that's followed. Yeah, I don't go into my doctor and have him just start talking about all sorts of things in the weather. I want him to go through a, a set of questions and take me through a process. It builds confidence because what I know is where is this going? You know, it's kind of due diligence. And so we can not only build trust through, our, through other people and our social proof, but we can you know, gain trust just through our actions. Be deliberate, be authentic. You know, one of the worst things that people do is they come from a non-sales background, but their job, you know, as it is here at Valenta, for example, and many other places, we step into a role where we may not have come from a sales background, but we've got a perception of what sales is. And so we start to kind of put on this salesperson suit and go in and start using very salesy language and it lacks authenticity. And, you know, I use the example, the human face has got 43 muscles in the human face. And whether we know it or not, we're picking up on all those 43 muscles and what they're doing. If somebody lacks authenticity, we're, we're great uh, radars for that. You know, I call it my spidey sense. There's something just not aligned. You know, there's something between the body language, the tone and the words they use. And it just doesn't quite gel. It lacks authenticity. And there's probably nothing more off-putting to a buyer than a lack of authenticity because it's not even at that point about the product or the service. I just don't quite trust what I'm getting out of this unit that's sitting in front of me. And so authenticity, consistency is really important. So there's lots of ways in which we can make sure that we build on this trust. And so if you think about even just the things I've just mentioned, they become, like I said, they almost become like uh, batteries in a sense that, you know, we could basically have down here something that looks like a battery, you know, and we basically want to make sure we stay, you know, how charged is each of our batteries? How many referrals do we have? How many case studies do we have? Um, how often am I getting them? Am I up to date? Are they relevant, the case studies, to the needs of the target market I'm going after, for example? The stronger I build these, the, the, the more I fill these buckets with, with authenticity, consistency, truth in my story, truth in myself, focus on, on building that trust, my social proof, then the, then the more charged my battery is, the more charged it is, the better chances I've got of success. I can't, you won't go and see that movie just because your mother says so, because if they're charging $95 a ticket, you ain't going, no matter how much mum says she really loves the latest Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> right. So just like the others, each of them has to has to exist in some way, shape or form, unless one's very, very overpowering. You know, if somebody wants to give me a free Ferrari, even if I don't need a car, if it's zero yet, I'll, I'll probably say, hey, I'll take it. So it's possible. But in the general rule of things, each of these need to exist and exist in some kind of reasonable level. So trust is important. There's multiple ways we can achieve that. Now, this one is an interesting one, no money. And another way of saying money, I think, is what is the financial motivation? All right, what's our, 
what's the incentive financially, whether it's uh, if we're talking about Valenta BPO, for example, Valenta does an amazing job of saving people money on their, their human resource expenses and on process costs within their business, fundamentally what we do. Yeah. Um, but that alone, you know, is, is not reason to change. We need to make sure that it's fulfilling the other needs. It's not purely about money. But there needs to be an incentive. Or, for example, in the case of buying a car, I need to make sure I have a budget. So as much as the government gives you an incentive to do so, you still need to have the money in the bank to make that, that decision. So I have to have the money. But also, equally in your case, we've got two things. You've got the budget. So I've got that component of, of finance as solved. But I also have the financial motivation. You know, why am I doing it? Well, because there's a deal there where I'm going to get, you know, a, a financial benefit for making that decision now through a tax refund or, or rebate or whatever, however they call it. So I've got different approaches to this idea of the financial motivation and it needs to exist. Um, often, you know, you'll have sales managers and business managers around there. You go, oh, I don't sell on price. Don't sell on price, which is true. Okay. Often you've got the more expensive product in the market. And if that is the case, if you imagine if, for example, this is not winning for me and my, my price is higher than the market, then what do I have to make sure that I've got? A much closer attention to their need. I'm fulfilling a need much more closely and I've got much more trust in the market than my competitor. I may be more expensive, but I get a pass here because I'm stronger here and here. So you can see how they start to kind of relate to one another. But again, just because there's a government incentive doesn't mean you're going to buy a car. A, mm. I may not need a car, all right? Or B, as much as I need it, I don't have the money in the bank to still go and buy it. Right. Yeah, you're right. The other, thing, the, the other thing I would say about money, and I really I like to remind people of this, if I write a sales book, actually, it's going to have two pages. It's not about you and it's not about the money, all right? The finances or the price is, is what's called a hygiene factor in sales, which is to say the price has to be right. So when you bought the car, now that you've narrowed it down, you've got a government incentive, you need the SUV because you've got to fit the kids in, the, all, the, all the bikes and trikes and trolleys and all that fun stuff, hygiene factor. And you've, you've got the money, but you've now gone out and you've gone, okay, well, which of these car dealers, for example, shall I buy it at? All right. Ultimately, the decision, the, the, the financial side is a necessary component. They have to have the right price for example, or you have to have the financial, the financial motivation to do it, but it doesn't win you the business, all right? So often what happens is a salespeople and people in business go, well, our price must have been too much. You have to be in the ballpark. You have to have a, a financial position that is close enough for people to say yes for you, but it isn't what wins you the business. It simply makes sure that you're in the game. If your price for a ream of copy paper, I came out of the office supplies industry, right? Now, I could charge more for a ream of office supplies paper, you know, just A4 copy paper, because I had much more of this and I had much more of this. I understood <laughs> needs and I could meet them. And so I could say, look, I'm not $5 for a ream of paper, but I am $5.50. Cool. Okay, I'm okay. I'm in the ballpark. It's a hygiene factor. I have to have it, but it doesn't win me or lose me the business. If my price though is $10, now I'm in a world of hurt. So I have to be there and in the, in the right space, but it doesn't, it doesn't prompt the buying decision. So often what I say to people is you have to have it, you have to address it. The customer is going to yeah. want it. You're going to want the best price for your high on dying. Right? So certainly, essentially, Chris, if I was after a Maserati, then yes. I mean, from a money perspective, that's, you know, got the exclusivity that goes with it, but perhaps your needs and trust and whatever the fourth one is, you know, is going to be uh, fulfilled more than the money factor. But like you said, you have to be within that realm of the money, right? Correct. So, yeah. So you still have to have the money in the bank in that perspective. And also you'd find they're still going to go, well, um, look, man, I, I, I can buy a secondhand one up the street for X or your new one, or there's two dealers. I can go to another dealer. And so, Really what it does is it, it starts to, it's necessary, again, hygiene factor, it's necessary for the, for the person in the sales position to be in the, in the ballpark and make sure that you've got an offering from a financial perspective that makes sense, 
um, and it does not put you out of the game. It gets you in the game. It just doesn't win you the game. It puts you on the field. It makes sure that you've got a chance to kick a goal. It doesn't kick the goal for you. Um, I'll give you an example. In, in the office supplies industry, when we used to do tenders and put out pricing, um, we were never over anybody else's price. In fact, normally, we were about 30% below the, the market price that was being charged for their office supplies, on average. We didn't win all our deals. So every deal, give or take, was 30% below the market. We didn't win every deal. We might win 20 or 30% of them. So in 70% in of those cases, you could save 30% on your office supplies, which some might say is a widget, but you don't win the business because there's so much more to take into consideration. Right? <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, and, and in your Maserati case, it's a really good example. What's the need for the Maserati driver? Well, it's not going to without fit the kids. Without, <laughs> no, without casting, for all our Maserati driving listeners out there, not casting dispersions on Maserati drivers, but there's something that's happening for you, right? <laughs> is it what we're doing is we're probably, I mean, just this is just an armchair psychologist, but what I'd say is it's a reflection of you, right? What's happened is on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we've now moved into self-esteem uh, and uh, self-actualization, where I am the best me that I can be and I'm showing you this through my car, yeah? Secondary, there might be a practical thing, which is I like racing cars, I grew up watching cars. We bought on emotion, right? Mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna be driving a Maserati and I wanna look like the CEO or the, or the you know, entrepreneur that I am, the successful person I am. I wanna show the world that. That's the emotional decision. The logical decision is, hey, yeah, man, it's, it's fast, I love cars, I'm in the car club. I gotta go to the fun, golf right? club and it's got a big boot, right? So. It's a great example of going, where does Maslow come in in that? You know, what's the need that's being fulfilled? It's an emotional need, I'm guessing. I'm sure not mm. all Ferraris and Maseratis are sold on an emotional need, but I reckon there's quite a few. I'd say so. <laughs> I'd say so, right? So we can see that in each of these decisions, you can kind of tie it back and start to connect it to, you know, to these four reasons people buy. Money is a hygiene fact. The last one is no hurry. So we won't buy if we don't have a need, whether it's human need, you know, my emotional needs, the safety, security, food, toilet paper. Who would have guessed it, hey? I won't buy if you don't trust you. If you're not trustworthy, if I don't trust your brand, if I don't think you're consistent, if I don't think you're being authentic with me, yeah, if you don't see any evidence of anybody else trusting you. You know, it's, it's the old saying is, and I really like this, so I recommend to anybody out there, think about language that you use. I won't say, you know, we've got an amazing business. What I'll say is our clients really love, uh, I don't, don't believe me, believe them. Yeah. And so it's really important. This idea of social proof or third party, you know, proof becomes important and you can impact that just through language, just how you describe yourself in your business. Don't believe me, believe them. You should check out our five-star Google reviews. It's amazing. 165 so far for the business. We've got a financial motivation whether it's checked out that the budget's there and they've got the budget for the job, whether it's discounting for a particular reason, if it's a sale, an incentive, the government's done it. The government wants a buying decision. What do they do? I create a financial motivation. And what else do they do? What else is linked to that tax incentive? Not sure. A date? <laughs> a date. That's exactly what it is. A date. You I know what? I had, a, I had a friend who also um, took up the initiative and they only had seven days to get their vehicle in the country. So yeah, right. um, they're very stressed. The government then extended the rebates. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So, but, but what happened? Pushed, happens us. We pushed her. And it cre exactly, because what have we got? We've, we've created scarcity, fear of missing out. So I'm only going to say toilet paper one more time, but if you don't doubt the idea of scarcity and as a human being, what scarcity does to us, then you've not been watching the world in the last, you know, nine months because we've seen scarcity in action. We've seen what happens to people emotionally with a fear of missing out. And we can do that in business and we need to do that in business because the opposite is this, right? The opposite is you'll get the same deal now. Um, what about in six months time? Yeah, I'll give you the same deal in six months time. Okay. I'll probably just do it in then. Mm -hmm. right? Where's your call to action? What's the compelling reason to act now? And probably one of the most common things I see for people out in the sales environment is not giving people a reason to act now. I'll see people put out a proposal for business 
and, I, and it will say, you know, valid for 30 days. And I go, well, what happens after 30 days? They go, oh, I'll probably just do it again. Right? So it's, it, it, it lacks authenticity, but at least they have it. Often there's just no uh, connection with why somebody should act now. And again, whether you're a financial services business, an accountant, FMCG, what's the purpose for acting now? I mean, at the moment in the market, you've got some great examples. You know, so the other way of putting this, sorry, no hurry, the other way to kind of describe that or ask it is to go, why now? Why, why should that person make a buying decision for your product or service now? What is, what is the opportunity that they're going to take advantage of that won't otherwise be there in 30 days or 60 days or a year or whatever it is? What's, what's, what's the opportunity that shall disappear if we don't act? Or what's the dark clouds on the horizon? What's the risk to that business or that person if they don't act now? Whether it's carrot or the stick, you know, either mm. something's going to come and, and hurt you and impact you negatively, or there's an opportunity that, that works in your favor you can take advantage of with a timeline. Now, in your case, it's interesting because it's kind of legislative. It's a government thing. So for a lot of businesses, you might find that your reason for people to act now might be legislation. It might be technology. It could be uh, stock availability. It could be mm. wastage. It could be a time limited sale. I mean, I think we're all pretty familiar with a thing called a stock take sale. <laughs> now, just because you're doing a stock take doesn't mean there's any urgency to it, right? But what we do, we go, hey, the sale's on, so I've got to go and I've got to do it now. Boxing day sale. I'm and literally my size going to might run out, Chris. Like they may not have my size, they may not have the colour I want, okay. you know. It's all urgency, I've got to get it's to, all tension. <laughs> I've got to get to the front of the line. Yeah, it's a <laughs> boxing day sale. I've got 19 people. I've got to climb over to get to that Xbox that's twenty dollars off. So we create scarcity, fear of missing out. And it's really important that we give somebody a reason to act now. If we don't, if you think about most people in life, all of us in life, we've, we've got piles upon piles upon piles of things that are coming at us, whether it's emails, texts, work things, family things, you know, personal things we want to achieve. We've got a, we've got a, a mental pile going on in our head. If I'm in a business and I'm talking to C-level decision makers, they've got an in-trade. They've got an inbox, they've got a LinkedIn box that is just full. Lots and lots of things and lots of demands, lots of priorities. And everybody wants to say, I'm a priority, like buy my thing, do my project. And like I said, this doesn't just relate. I mean, imagine if I am the head of a department in a business. This is exactly the set of criteria I'd want to go to my CEO with. I go, we need to do this and the value to our business is this. Here's the data, here's the facts, here's my science behind me, trust me. Here's some other people in the organization that believe the same thing. The financial return to the company is this. We're gonna make an ROI of X, Y, Z, which will blow your socks off, but we need to do it now or the opportunity will be gone because there's a uh, legislation will change, uh, contracts are gonna change, a competitor in the market's moving out, a competitor in the market's moving in, whatever it is, we need to do it now. And so whether I'm, selling something to somebody in the sense of I've got a widget or a product or service to sell, or whether, as I said, just as a, as a person traveling through the business world, I want to be able to build a case and persuade people in my direction, then these become really important. And what we're able to do is leverage it just through life generally, um, but certainly to, to kind of get people making decisions in our, in our direction. And this last one's really important because what I want to do is, is send my job to the top of the heap. Yeah, what the government did for you was take something that you'd been putting off for years, that car, right? And they moved it to the top of the pops from a financial perspective. You're like, yeah, we, we'll do this now because they did this. They really charged this battery up. They gave you 100% on why now and they gave you 100% on this. Hmm. And you're like, oh, okay, yep. And so something, this need, your, your old car, you'd kind of kept servicing and putting off Suddenly you went, oh, I do need that. Mm. Actually, I do need that. And, and the trust just came into the purchase. Yeah, I'll get the Hyundai because I trust it. Suddenly, when the time was right and the fear of missing out on the offer was there and the fear of that financial benefit was there and the fear of missing out on these two things, suddenly my need seems very strong. Mm. So strong, I'm going to rush a car out of another country to get here just to make sure I get it. Uh, now, and I, now, I like what you but, said about the... Um, when we were talking about, you know, the emotional way, because when I went to my husband and said, you know, is this a good decision? I, my head was thinking I love the car, but then I justified it with the money and the yeah. financial benefits straight away and the safety. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot to the theory, right? <laughs> oh, 
Oh, absolutely. And, and look, if you think about buying a home, homes, homes will be very similar, particularly in a family situation, in that we go, we'll tend to have a need that is a Maslow need as far as our self-esteem and where we believe we fit in society as far as where we live. Just is, right? I've mm. lived in Sydney, I've lived in Melbourne, I've lived in Brisbane. Now, if I go to those suburbs, you know, where, where the well-to-do live, they're living there for reason, to be around those and to be associated with I live at. Probably probably Sydney is a really great example. You know, somebody says Bondi, they've, they've made that decision for a very clear reason in my mind. Now, there's no doubt that when we do that, we go, we walk in and we go, oh, yeah, but it's so close to work and all my friends are there. I just start to list out, I start to justify this decision. But it was purely emotional. I want to live there because it makes me feel good about me. It's where I belong. Right. Mm. And then I, yeah, it's a safe neighborhood. It's got the train line. It's blah. I feel it. I feel in the detail. I justify with logic. But in essence, that first decision is an emotional one. Mm. And so, it, like I said, it might be I, 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 I'm in the herb and spice business. If I go to Mullumbimby or Byron Bay, my food decisions are going to be based on this because I want to be perceived to be natural and holistic, et cetera. So I'm going to buy organic foods and, and buy off the co-op. And then I'll justify it with some logic. But, but these things tie in really, really close to them. And so there's no doubt that you can really supercharge some of these and start to overcome others. But the reality is when you can meet them all, that's where you get kind of the magic happens and you start to build all of them up. And so if I'm, a, if I'm to talk to a business and really quickly say to them, look, can you go about you know, finding a market or getting into a market? understand what they need too many companies come from their own perspective let me tell you about me let me tell you about my service and how wonderful it is let me tell you about my people and how awesome they are you know what a great product what a great price more addressing the need of the of the client the real and not just well they need hammers and i've got hammers so here's my awesome hammer deeper than that what are the hammers used for yeah what's the purpose of it how does it work in your business how does it impact your goals how does it help you achieve your five-year plan really get under the skin, you know, kind of really deep dive into what the, the underlying needs of that decision maker is, that business is, and how, how you can get value attached to your product or service. Build up your case studies, do webinars, do case studies, referrals, ask for referrals, testimonials, really kind of simple stuff. It's not time consuming. It's just get it done. Ask the question. Every time you've got a successful client implemented in whatever your business is, get a testimonial. Get a Google review if you're a business that's kind of operating online. Get your Google reviews. You know, they're, they're, it takes a little bit of time and effort, but only a little bit. And the value that provides when somebody looks at your business and says, here's 45 companies and some really great names that recommend this, this business. Or here's, you know, 400 Google reviews and they're rating a 4.9. It, it tells me the story. And it's not hard to do. Get it up there. Um, the money's obvious. You'll have a cost input and you've got a need to sell it at a certain price figure out where that is. The stronger these are, the more that will be. Mm. So for example, let's use the toilet paper. I said I wasn't going to say it, but let's say it one more time. To use the example of toilet paper, what happens to the price? As soon as it gets scarce, the price goes up, right? You can sell your toilet paper online for who knows what. So what I can do is the more that I create scarcity, the, the more I can increase my price, for example. So some really great tie togethers for this stuff. And if I start to communicate, if I look at my emails or in this day and age, LinkedIn invitations, things of that nature, get away from, let me tell you all about me or my product and service, focus on these four things. Do you address them in your email? Because the first buying decision I make is to engage with you. Because the other thing is people kind of, there's this sense that, well, I can, I can send an email out there, get a meeting and that's how it works. The first sale, the first thing somebody buys is an invitation to have a conversation. Most businesses, you know, are going to have somebody reach out to them. Maybe they've advertised and somebody rings in. Does your advertising really address these? And start to have a look at advertising and watch advertising, right? Because, I mean, let's face it, they're ahead of the game when it comes to buyer behavior. See how advertisers address these things, right, and where it fits into it. Lots of sales, stock take, running out, don't miss out, you know, new brand, new, new technology, et cetera, right? Trust your brand. Here's the sale price. How does it meet the need? Have a look at advertising. Have a look at how people will do it and how you respond to it. And the other thing is look at how you've responded to things and made buying decisions and be kind of true to yourself. Go, oh, yeah, actually, 
what made me do that was this. They put me on a short lead. You know, a classic, a classic is in real estate. If you're selling your house or, or you're looking to buy a house, sorry, you're looking to buy a house, real estate agent's going to tell you they've got what? Yeah, we've got a few offers on the table already. Mm, always. Do you? Always. Why yeah. always? Always. <laughs> what I want to do. Exactly. Pay I want to create a fear of, fear of missing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Scarcity. What I'm doing is I'm creating scarcity. So in all facets, when you start to look around how people sell and then also have an experience when you go, I had a bad experience with somebody, a bad experience with a salesperson or a bad experience with a company. And you ask yourself, well, why, what didn't feel right? Mm. Were they price crazy? Were they inconsistent? Were they late? Were they inauthentic? Were they trying to be salesy? Did they not care about my need and actually just came in talking about themselves for 20 minutes? You want to have a bad appointment? You want to have a bad meeting with somebody? In fact, for, for ladies out there or guys, you want to have a bad date? Have somebody talk about themselves for 20 minutes and see how good that feels. It's just, ugh, it's horrible, right? It's the last date you'll ever have. It is the last date you'll ever have with that person. And it's exactly the same for business. It'll be the last time you ever see that salesperson. You won't have them back through the door. You just had your first date and you didn't make out at the end of it because they did nothing but talk about themselves, right? Business is exactly the same. The more you care about the needs of your, the more you value their, their needs, the more value you place on the success of your client, the better chance you have of success yourself. And it's really only through the client success that you succeed anyway. It's only when they win that you do win, right? Because they become your referral, your testimonial, the case study. They tell their friends, they have a great experience and then they move to another business and they buy off you again, right? The, the, if you can authentically value that, that success of your client and when you talk to them, they see a person in front of them that absolutely just oozes passion for their success. Now imagine that first date. That person's just all about you, interested in you how they can lift you up and make sure that you have a great experience on this date. And all of a sudden it's a very different relationship. And maybe there'll be that second date, same in business and in sales. So yeah, I love it. that's it's great. That's it's just bang reasons. on Chris. <laughs> that's the four reasons people don't buy. Well, I think it's absolutely bang on. It totally resonates minutes. with me. <laughs> 43 good. minutes, but we're good. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris, for your time. That was You're awesome. Um, like I said, it resonated really well with me. Um, my background is marketing and um, I also like what you're touching on, you know, like Chris is saying here, we don't need to spend a lot of time, especially with that trustworthiness when we are asking for Google, uh, Google business reviews and testimonials and case studies. There are ways to actually source that information where it is actually quite an organic process. And I think also um, the benefit of that too is that you are actually actively sourcing client feedback. So off the back of what Chris is saying too, you know, you can actually improve your sales process even more uh, through your client feedback. So I think there's a lot to think about from what Chris has gone through today. Um, so thank you again, Chris, for your time. You're welcome. And I would like to thank everyone who has watched and I hope you join us for our next episode of The Insider with Valenta BPO.